Thank you. Thank you. Um, what I what I love about Riverside is that it's active. It's diverse. There's so many things to do. There are so many choices. Um, but what I like most about Riverside, and something that I learned last night, I got here pretty late and I was having dinner uh, locally and I was talking to a couple of the waitresses. And we, like you, we're proud of where we come from. We want to stay here. You know, we like it here. And we, we, love the community, we love the neighborhood, we love to engage with one another, we love to experience life together. And I think that that's what brings all generations together, not just millennials, but what we've learned, and, and I think that we're gonna hear again um, in a little bit from Mr. Jenkins, is um, that a lot of the, the today's desires is really the experience, is really the, the path towards the goal, the path towards the, the motivation or whatever the cause might be. And I'm gonna go through um, a process to kind of identify things that are occurring in Riverside uh, in a way that continues to allow a significant amount of experiences towards the path to reaching a professional life and family and attaining a cause that, that we are all after. Uh, all the while without having compromised what unique Riverside is. And I think a lot of what you're gonna see is a lot of what Bakersfield is about as well. You're doing a lot of things and hopefully you know that uh, there are so many institutions here in, River in Bakersfield that uh, you won't compromise. Bakersfield College, for example, 100 plus year institution, 15,000 students, that's, that's amazing. So um, on screen is a, images of four colleges and universities that, that exist in Riverside. And in Riverside, the student population is just over 57,000 students. And those are the new labor, that's the new people that are gonna have jobs in Riverside. And we are continuing to grow and continuing to make an effort to avoid what we have called many years the brain drain coming out of Riverside and trying to keep them to stay motivated to stay in Riverside. Uh, and while they're in school, they're able to experience, um, while they're in school, they're able to experience so many different things. And those different things are not very far apart, but they're very, very different. And they allow for a significant amount of choice and a lot of diversity. The city of Riverside, as part of that $1.5 billion transformation, renovated the Fox Theater, renovated the Municipal Auditorium. Now they're both being run by Live Nation. And as a demonstration of that choice, of that diversity, that provides the experience that we're all after, whether millennial or, or me, um, it's, it's available in Riverside. On one day, about two years ago, uh, at the Municipal Auditorium, Social Distortion sold out a show, about 2,200 uh, people there. And the same night, Willie Nelson sold, a, sold out a show at the Fox Theater. Those two things are about two blocks away from each other. Can you imagine the crowd in downtown that night? It, it, was, it was really, really cool. Um, and there was a lot of different people in each of those two shows and just as a identification that I'm in Riverside, I'm here to study, I'm going to school, I'm going to medical school, I'm going to law school, whatever it is, I'm gonna remember that show that I went to and that, that, that's valuable to me, that matters. And I think that that's part of the reason that we're starting to put some headway into turning around the brain drain, turning around the attack, attraction. So we do have some work to, to go. Um, Riverside does have a very successful downtown pedestrian mall. It's not new, it's been there a long, long time. Um, and along the way, it has transformed. And we, thankfully so, um, me and, and everybody at City Hall uh, is, is responsible enough to know that we don't know everything there is to know. We're, we're hopefully not too arrogant to allow the flexibility to occur, including in the downtown pedestrian mall. There is a lot of culture, there's a lot of performing arts that are on the downtown Penestra Mall, but there's still a lot of opportunity, and that opportunity we're still trying to harness. At the bottom um, right of that picture on the screen right now is a, 
as a fairly empty surface parking lot uh, that we are working to build. And we're doing that in order to kind of provide for a higher density in downtown, a greater opportunity for living and, and gathering and experiencing life together. And that project that that project that we're working on on that corner, we're talking about almost a third of an acre. And on that third of an acre, uh, we have been able to amend our downtown specific plan to allow for within the same development, uh, a mixed income housing project of 44 units and an office along the ground floor and a retail function along the opposite ground floor facing Main Street. Um, we're building everything in a way that is about the experience and about um, being able to live in the unit and have your entire day go to the office and have dinner afterwards at a different project that we, oops, that we are working on and never having got in your car. Right, never having ex left the area that would hopefully end up being a resilient downtown. And that's what we're after. We're after that, that crowd that can live together, that uh, experience that can be together. And they're young. These pictures are people that live in downtown. Um, I talked to them. I asked them if I can put them on the screen. Uh, they were very, very excited. They, much like all of us, are very professional. They're very educated. And they're very ambitious. And they want to, like I do, they want to work and play and have their kids and all of these things all at the same time together. And they want to do that in a way that doesn't um, limit their opportunity to make decisions as to one day I'm going to do this and the other day I'm going to do that while at the same time be involved in whatever cause they choose to be involved in. So they go to, they move into that apartment complex that we're working on and they live together in a 2,000 square foot apartment next to a 700 square foot apartment where the rents are compatible but at market based on the different sizes and there's a mixture, a diversity in the population that lives in there, there's a diversity in the uses that are around it, there's a diversity in the options of those kinds of uses. Um, and after they go to work in downtown, they leave their apartment units, they go work for Beth, Best Best in Krieger, a law firm downtown, and afterwards they have dinner at the mess hall market they were working on in downtown. It's right next to the Fox Theater, it's about a block and a half away from that project that I just showed you, um, and it's just a situation where in that mess hall is, is the mess hall's kind of a play on the historic building, the Hess Mall. Um, and the, in that building, there is um, different vendors where the family can get together, and I skipped the slide. The families can get together and um, one person have a hamburger over here, another person have sushi over here, get your coffee, get your beer, and sit down together and eat the different things all together at the same time. Like the fact that in downtown, you can do that on a weekday. You'll do it, okay. Uh, thank you. Like the fact that in downtown you can do that on a weekend, on a weekday, and then on a weekend you get up in the morning and still don't have to leave downtown. Downtown is still uh, diverse and is still resilient. There's still education, there's elementary schools downtown, there's a high school, there's a charter performing arts school, there's a culinary school, everything is there. And you can get a haircut downtown, you can get do your grocery shopping downtown, you can entertain uh, family, friends, buy a book, lounge, do your homework, do whatever you gotta do all in downtown. Um, and we know that we are all active, myself included, the millennials, they're active people. Um, they still skateboard, some of them. Um, and in, in this area, this resilient downtown that we are working on, um, hopefully they will be able to still not have to get in their car. They can go for a run and go on the skateboard and actually play golf. There's a golf course that's about a mile away, which I walk to all the time. And this happens and still you have not got into the car and you're living and surviving within that resilient downtown, that community, which is growing and growing every single day. 
So after you had your breakfast and after you went uh, to on your run and you went to dinner, there is a myriad of, of festivals that occur in the downtown Pedro Stern Mall, I think once a week. Um, I think once a week. Um, I can tell you as a city employee, um, sometimes I have a hard decision trying to figure out which one I'm gonna go to. Um, and I end up going to somewhere else. The Festival of Lights, I'm, I don't know if you've heard of the Festival of Lights at the Mission Inn. Um, just an amazing show. Arts Walk every Thursday, uh, Pub Crawl every Monday, um, the Lunar Festival, just the list goes on and on and on. And like I mentioned, uh, a significant part of uh, the experience is the path or the journey toward, to the cause. And whatever that cause may be, uh, whether you're a developer or a bureaucrat like me, or a lawyer and that's what you trained and that's what you're good at, uh, you have a family and you're doing all of those things and you're on your way and along the way you're experiencing the uh, diversity of choice in where to eat and where to entertain and where to play and all of those things. But there are so many causes in Riverside that causes that allows people to be passionate about. And that passion has turned into many, many different sections of Riverside that come together, that are involved politically, that are involved with the city, that are involved with their neighbors. Home Front of Campanza, for example, is a project which is a dream project that I worked on. I can't even believe that I had the opportunity to do, to do so. In Riverside, there's a community, a former military um, uh, base in Riverside called Alanza. And in Arlanza, there was this building that was boarded up. It was the former um, officers club of that, of that military compound, and it was boarded up. The city bought it and converted it, rehabbed it, con renovated the historic building, converted it to 30 units of affordable housing for family reunification of homeless veterans that are disabled with kids and children. It's gonna, it just opened, and thank you. It, it just opened um, about two weeks ago. We're planning the, the ribbon cutting, but the point in that is that that project created this, this buzz amongst many different people that have so many different passions. People that are passionate about veterans, that are passionate about homelessness, affordable housing, historic preservation, neighborhood. Everybody came out and worked together because of that desire to be involved in the transformation. I, I often have said that those things are, I think, what causes um, Riverside to be, to be at that brink of maturing into urbanity. I've said that so many times, I'm kind of tired of saying it. So uh, we, we're right there, and in, in that regard, it's, it's, like, it's like Riverside is its own little millennial. It's active, it's changing. It's, every time we think of something new, uh, there's all, always a lot of initiatives, and everybody in town gets involved. I wanna be involved in that. I wanna change it to this other thing. Uh, the Eastside Hill Zone is an effort that we're working on in a community in Riverside. Uh, it's called the Eastside, the community is called the Eastside. And it's the idea that a neighborhood and the livability of that neighborhood is really what causes the perception or the feeling of poverty versus the actual income of the person, of the family. Where if the neighborhood lives well and it's, the housing stock is in good condition and then the parks are playable and all of those things, that that is what causes a person to live comfortably in the day of the life of, of that family. It's the livability of his day, of their day, versus the income. We, I know that Riverside and Bakersfield, uh, we have similar demographics. Um, your median income is a little higher than ours. Um, our poverty rate is a little higher than yours. Um, but they're right there. Ours is 54,000, yours is 53. Uh, ours is about 19, yours, ours is Yours is about 19, ours is about 19.8% poverty. But this has changed that community, that Eastside community, which is a very, very poor area in Riverside, uh, has changed that community and has transformed it because we want to be involved, because of that passion. And because we feel as though we're not too arrogant to believe that the innovation is gonna occur and someone else else has to do it and not just necessarily the city hall. So that's my presentation. Uh, if 
you have any questions, uh, my contact information is on screen. Uh, I'd be happy to, to share with anything, or if you want to come to Riverside, I'm very, very happy to host you anytime that you want to come by. Thank you. Emilio, thank you very much for that. I'd like to welcome Summit partner Nick Ortiz, President and CEO of the Greater Bakersfield Chamber of Commerce, to the podium to introduce today's keynote speaker. Nick, thanks for coming today. Good morning and sorry for the delay. I walked from the extreme back of the room. We wanted to make sure everybody who actually paid for a ticket got the best seats in the house this morning. Um, I wanted to start by saying maybe in true millennial fashion, I said this last night, they saved the best partner for the last because millennials, it's all about us, it's all about me. And I know Laura uh, Weiner, who's our, our, our uh, consultant who helps us plan this, is making sure that I stay on time. So unlike Richard Chapman, I won't talk about new wave music or French poetry or any other things that he likes to talk about when he takes the podium. First off, and seriously, I want to uh, express my, my extreme gratitude for our sponsors, our platinum sponsor, Dignity Health, um, and all of our gold and silver sponsors, all of our, you who bought a ticket or bought a table today. We appreciate you um, investing in this event and making it better each year. I also want to um, thank and just um, congratulate our partners, KEDC and CSUB, um, organizations that along with the Chamber are really dedicated to growing our economy and providing the workforce for the future. And I think from the, the programs and some of the presentations we've heard, we have got a lot to be proud of. We've got a lot to be optimistic about. The committee from all three organizations planning this conference has been meeting since the fall, and I think we are all very excited about this year's theme. And it's particularly interesting to me. Um, we participate through the Bakersfield Chamber in a number of industry groups and trade associations, and yes, even trade associations have trade associations, um, around the issue of millennials and how chambers and membership organizations can reach them, can communicate with them, and can make our organizations relevant to them. Um, in fact, in the chamber industry, I can say millions of man hours and millions of dollars has literally gone into research about how we can do a better job and how we create organizations that remain relevant in the future. And so some of our colleagues in the Western region will look at me or look at some of my other younger colleagues and executives and ask, so what do we do? What do they want? And I, of course, look at them very smugly, very self-assuredly and say, well, I'm a millennial and Half of my staff are millennials. And then I say, we don't even know. We, we don't even know what they want. <laughs> but that's half in jest. Um, but it also speaks, I think, to a broader truth, um, a truth for the chamber, a truth for KEDC, about organizations that rely on investment and volunteerism and membership in order to do good in our community and drive the economy. How can we be relevant? So Richard started out the summit by referencing Ray Dezember and his recent passing. And as we all know, Ray was a driving force in the business industry and in the chamber and in the creation of KEDC. Um, organizations that still thrive today and carry on, I think, a great legacy. His passing combined with our theme today has required me to reflect and ask not only who will be the next generation of business leadership in, in Bakersfield and Kern County, but also what kind of Bakersfield and Kern County do they want to build? So this is a question and a conversation that is obviously going to last longer than the summit. I hope everyone has come away with a deeper understanding of some of these issues we put in front of you. And I really think that our keynoter, Ryan Jenkins, is going to give us a really good information about these generational challenges we face. So Ryan is an internationally recognized millennial keynote speaker and author. He helps organizations and leaders gain clarity around the millennial generation so that they can effectively lead, communicate, and brand in tomorrow's multi-generational marketplace. Based in Atlanta, Ryan runs a blog and podcast at nextgenerationcatalyst.com. Um, he has been featured in Inc. Magazine, Forbes, Fast Company, Mashable, and Yahoo. And uh, I'd like you to help me welcome him to the stage today. Like Ryan Jenkins.
right, good morning. How are we doing? Yes, it is still morning, if you can believe it. All right, we're gonna kick things off with a quick word association exercise. I'm gonna flash a phrase up on the screen, and when you see that phrase, I want you to shout out, unfiltered, unfiltered, shout it out, shout out the, the first word that pops in your mind, all right? So what is the first word that comes to mind when you hear today's generations? Lazy, well, that didn't take long. <laughs> Boy, you had that one ready. What else? Unknown? Unknown? Interesting, what else? Innovative. Entitled, everyone at once, <laughs> entitled, yeah. Innovative, I like that. You and I are gonna be friends. Immediate gratification, risky. Clueless. Clueless. <laughs> the best, all right. I think that's my CSUB students in the house, I think. Next to the best. Next to the best. I th all right, we, we, I think we covered all of them, right? Hopefully. Now, I, I have to be honest, I pulled a fast one on you, but don't beat yourself up. This happens every time I do this, this short, simple little exercise. And I didn't say anything about millennials, did I? I didn't say anything about Generation Z. But that, I think, at least all the, the, the responses I heard were geared towards the millennials. And I think why that happens every single time that I've, that I've done this exercise is that the most tension surrounds this generation, the most question marks surround the millennial generation. And so that's why I'm here today. That's why the theme of today is, is really the next generation of millennials. And so that's what we're gonna talk about today. Specifically, we're gonna talk about next generation engagement, how you can truly engage and leverage this generation in your organizations, your community, on your teams. And I hope to have time for a couple uh, questions. If we don't get there, my email is up on that slide, rj at ryan-jenkins.com. And then all of today's slides that you're about to see are gonna be available at that link at the bottom of that slide, ryan-jenkins.com slash KES. And uh, I just checked right before I came up here, um, and my site has actually crashed for the second time ever. Um, I like to think that's because my latest Instagram pic went viral just, just, just a few minutes ago. <laughs> I'd like to think that. So hopefully by the end of today, that it'll be back up in the next hour and um, you guys can engage there. But just know you don't have to take pictures of these slides. Don't try to jot everything down. It's all gonna be there for you for free, as long as the internet is turned on as well, which is, which is an important thing. Okay, uh, actually a couple of things before I, before I go into the agenda. And that is, this is gonna shock you, shocks every, every audience I ever tell this to, but I think it's 100% true. And that is this, I don't want you to listen to anything that I say. You go, wait a minute, you're the guy with the mic and the clicker, the intro. Very true, don't listen to what I say, listen to what you hear. I think those are drastic different things. And I think you can apply this methodology to any learning environment. Because we're all from different parts of the country at, at one point, we're all from different uh, generations. We all have unique situations, diverse teams, diverse situations, so not all of this is gonna fit neatly into a box. But there are gonna be certain things today, two or three things I hope, that resonate with you in your unique situation. And there are gonna be things that you resist as well. But those are all fertile ground for you to pinpoint and drive some depth into and start unpacking so you can move your organizations forward. Uh, second thing I'll say, one of my favorite quotes is by Oliver Holmes who said, a mind once stretched never regains its original dimensions. A mind once stretched never regains its original dimensions. And so that's my goal. After, when you leave uh, the session today, I want you thinking differently about the future. I want you thinking differently about the emerging generations. And so it's safe to say I'm gonna put some stretch marks on your brain, okay? I hope you're okay with that. And the last thing before I, I move on, and that is this. If at any point during today's session, if you just see me fall on my face right in front of you and seem to be lifeless up here, don't panic. No, no need to panic. It's uh, more than likely it's just because it's been over 30 minutes since I've texted or tweeted. So um, bear with me. Front row, just come up and like rub a mobile device on me and I'll be, I'll be fine. Because I am a millennial, if you didn't gather that from my super swag and extra uh, formal, informal attire, I am a millennial. So uh, bear with me. All right, let's jump into the content. Here's where we're going. We're going to talk about millennials. We're going to touch a little bit on Generation Z. And then we're gonna talk about some of the generational differences that exist. And then I'm gonna give you four elements, four examples and four strategies 
uh, to think about um, with your teams and organizations. All right, so here's a quick snapshot of the generations. Robin did a tremendous job on, on giving us some really good context. So we're just gonna build upon what she shared. And you'll see in the middle there, it, this chart, and the, these generations are done by age. And again, the age, depending on what study you look at, they're all a little different. So it's important that we consider generations as clues and not boxes. All right, and in my opinion, they're big clues, very big clues on how we sell, engage, lead, and communicate across generations. Uh, on the right side there, you'll see that's how large the US generations were at their peak. You'll notice a couple asterisks there in the bottom right. That's simply because these generations, unfortunately, aren't that large uh, just from uh, folks passing away. So I wanna give you a little context on why generations are so important today, why it's such a relevant conversation. And I wanna illustrate that by asking a question. So shout out the answer if you think you know it. What was the average life expectancy of humans in 1902? 42, 40, I don't hear a lot of 40s. 47, 48, 30, 38. Whoa, we're just losing a lot of confidence in the human race. 47 was the correct answer. That was the average life expectancy in 1902. Any guesses what it is today? A hundred, now, okay, we got some, a lot of confidence, I love it. I'm hearing a lot of 70s, 60s, 70s, 85, you guys are, this is, I like this, you guys have a lot of confidence in, in the, 78, that's really close. In the U.S., it is 79 years old, is the current life expectancy. And to melt your minds even more, they now say that the first person to ever celebrate their 150th birthday has already been born today. Imagine what it looks like to have a midlife crisis at the age of 75. <laughs> I can't even wrap my head around that. What does that look like? So here, here's why that's important. I'll give you some context. In over 100 years, we extended the life expectancy, at least in the US, about 32 years. It's pretty extraordinary. And so as medicine advances, as technology advances, we will be living longer. And so not only are we interacting with five generations in the workplace, but it's very possible, very feasible, that in the very near future, we'll be interacting with six, seven, eight, God forbid, nine different generations. So this is a very relevant topic, and it's only going to intensify. It's only going to accelerate, so I think that's why it's very important that we find our, our footing now. All right, so that gives us a good basis of where we are with the generations. Um, let's keep moving forward. Let's look at the 2016 workplace. This is the current makeup. You'll, see, you'll notice that Generation Z is now inching into the workplace, and that's mostly in the form of internships. Again, this is, this is a very uh, ambitious bunch. A lot of them are having internships in high school even. But here's what's important about 2015 and 2016. This was, these were the, this was really the first year that millennials now outnumber both Gen X and boomers in the workplace. That's why we had all those interesting dynamic and interesting words that came to your mind, right? Because they're challenging a lot of what's already been existing for how many years in the workplace. What's your best guess and shout it out if you know the answer. What's, what percentage of the workplace will be millennials and Generation Z for a little bit of by 2025, what percentage? Shout it out. 45, 75, I think that was Robin, I heard 75. She's, she's all over this. So that's the correct answer, 75%. Cue the jaw drop, cue the eye roll, go ahead. And sometimes I'll, I like to barricade the exits too before I show that stat so no one goes running out of the room screaming for their lives. But imagine, imagine, think about your, your situation and the way you work. I bet just five years ago, it's, it's drastically different, right, than, than how you work today. So fast forward 10 years, right, just a little bit under 10 years, imagine what your, how your work and your industry is gonna change when 75% of it are digital natives that think differently and approach the world in a completely different way. There's gonna be massive amounts of change. But don't panic, my name is Brian, I'm your friend. I'm here to help, okay? All right, give you a couple of millennial stats that can give you, paint the picture, give you some context around this generation. 
63% of millennials have a bachelor's degree, making them the most educated generation ever. Now, that doesn't say the most smartest <laughs> generation. It simply says the most educated. So for my millennials in the room, those that are currently enrolled at a university, it's a very crowded talent pool. What are you doing to rise above? 71% of millennials are disengaged at work, the most of any generation. And I'm going to give you some specific tactics on how to gobble up and erode that statistic in your specific organizations. 58% of millennials expect to leave their jobs in three years or less. Now, that, that, <laughs> that number says that they expect to leave in three years or less. Does anyone want to venture a guess what the average tenure of a millennial is currently? Did someone say six months? Oh, I'm sorry for, for that. Three years, yeah, it's, it's two years is, is, is the going rate at this point. There's some new research now coming out that's saying it's as uh, short as 16 months. The dynamic has changed, and as one of our panelists mentioned, it's costly, $25,000 to $30,000 to replace a millennial employee. Uh, ouch, right? So again, I'm gonna give you some statistics to hopefully to attack that. And then lastly, 70% of millennials across the globe might reject traditional work to, um, traditional business to work independently. So not only if you're an organization that's looking to recruit top talent, not only are you having to compete against your competitors to, to pluck that ripe millennial talent, but you're now actually having to compete against the millennials' own ambition to be an entrepreneur. And as we've seen, it's easier than ever before to be an entrepreneur, isn't it? The barriers are lower than ever before. You can uh, go to a Starbucks, launch a business, and market it to the world via social media uh, before lunchtime. And, and think about this, too. It, entrepreneurship was never, was, was, wasn't always sexy. There was a time where if you were an entrepreneur and you told someone you were an entrepreneur, someone would roll their eyes in the back of their head. They'd be saying, that means you don't have the skills to get a corporate job. Right? That's true. It's now sexy to be an entrepreneur. And a lot of millennials have a side hustle while they're still at school. So this is a, something that we have to lean into, and I'll give you a specific tactic on how to um, attack that statistic as well. All right, I think this is really important to put some context around as well, is millennials and Generation Z are truly the first global generations. 50% of millennials want opportunities for, for international work assignments. And 58% of adults worldwide, ages 35 and above, agree that kids today have more in common with their global peers than they do with adults in their own country. So what does that mean? An eight-year-old here in Bakersfield, California could have more in common with an eight-year-old in India than someone who's 65 in their own country. It's a global generation. We'll talk about how they became that way. Um, I'm fortunate enough to write for, I have a column for Inc.com. And the stuff that I write about that's mostly US based, you can find the same content, same ideas in the Moscow Times. So we live now in a very connected world, and this generation grew up in a very connected world. And we'll talk specifically about that. All right, so we're going to have some uh, fun with this now. We're going to talk about the evolution of the millennials, OK? We're going to take one millennials story, and we're going to call this individual Millennial Mike. And his story starts in 1988. Uh, and he was born. He was one in a million, literally. And we're going to fast forward to when things get a little interesting. And that is in the year 1996. Millennial Mike is infatuated with Nintendo, specifically Nintendo 64. Some of you are chuckling because this might be your son or daughter. Um, and so gaming fundamentally has rewired this generation. This is a generation that grew up gaming. Gaming is exploding. 97% of youth today play computer or video games. It's no longer something weird that you do in the basement of your mom's house, right? <laughs> gaming is exploding. Wait and see. You'll see much more eSports, which are you know, gamified sports, on a lot of channels in the very near future. But here's why gaming is important. Here's the first takeaway. Millennials desire feedback, difference making, and diverse teamwork. So let's tackle the first one. They desire feedback. Well, they grew up gaming, right? And what is gaming? Well, it's gaming is a constant feedback loop. You push a button, something happens. You choose this mission, something happens. And so you're in this environment where you're constantly receiving feedback. So that's an expectation they now pull into the workplace, and they expect constant feedback, 
Robin alluded to it earlier, and it's very true. Secondly, they, they want to be difference makers. That's why we play games. They immerse themselves in games to save the world, to have that epic win. They now pull that into the workplace. They want to have an impact on day one, right? Some of you probably felt this tension. And then lastly, they, they, uh, they want diverse teamwork. Millennial Mike was able to jump on Xbox, put on a headset, and play along somebody in real time that was halfway around the globe. So again, this has helped shape the thinking of this, this generation that bound, there's, they're really boundaryless, right? So that's our first takeaway. Now let's fast forward to the year 2000. Millennial Mike is in middle school, and he hears about this thing called AOL. Thinks that sounds kind of cool. Him and his buddies go home uh, after school. They jump online. About an hour later, they're able to create their username. <laughs> yep. Thank you, dial up. And they begin chatting with friends, and they're leaning into technology and testing and figuring it out and pushing the envelope. Here's what we learned from, from this phase in Millennial Mike's life. I'm sorry, my, my clicker is losing a little bit of gas, I think. Maybe I forgot to work out this morning. Millennials number two, or takeaway number two, millennials approach differently how they learn, work, socialize, communicate, play because of technology. It's fundamentally rewired their brain. All right, now let's move forward to the year 2003. This is where things get really interesting. Millennial Mike is in high school, and he has access to Google. How many of you had access to Google while in high school? Throw your hand up. All, all straight A students, I imagine, yes? Can I get a head nod? No? Okay, so let's all play along. What if we had access to Google in high school? What if we all did that? What, we, what would we have done? Shout it out. Not gone to the library. <laughs> what else? I would have started Facebook. You would have started Facebook. <laughs> and with that kind of gumption and ambition, I know you would have. I like that. What else? Plagiarizing. Plagiarizing. Shopped. Someone said shop. I love that, of course. Yeah, we would have all gotten really good at cutting and pasting, right? <laughs> cut, paste, cut, paste. Uh, I, I asked this question about a month ago in, a, in another session with, a, with an organization. A gal in the front row, it was just a knee-jerk reaction. As soon as I asked that question, she jumped out of her seat and said, I would have cheated better. <laughs> and everyone slowly nodded, like, that's what we were thinking, but no one said it. <laughs> and I loved it, too, that she was in the front row and said that. It was brilliant. Yeah, so, we're, so, so well, here's what's really important. Again, you know, access, you know, access to the Internet technology has shaped this generation. And the millennials are the first generation ever to not consider teachers or parents as the authority, but rather who or what do they consider the authority? Themself, I heard someone say. <laughs> the internet, right? You got the world's information at your fingertips, you better, you better believe you're gonna use it. So here's what we learned. Millennials consider the internet the authority and they think, thus think and approach problems fundamentally different, fundamentally. We'll move now to the year 2005. Millennial Mike is finally able to join Facebook. And I say finally because there was tons of buzz at the moment uh, around the idea of Facebook. And Facebook started in 2004. It was college only. 2005, it opened up to high school. And so you better believe Millennial Mike jumped all over it, started a, you know, a group, began connecting with other uh, students that were about to attend his college. And he made friends, even found a roommate before he even set foot on college campus. So we're using it as a tool. Also in 2005, Millennial Mike, he's about to go to college, he's a senior. His parents decide him to give him what? A cell phone. Decide to give him a cell phone. And for you parents in the room that gave your child a cell phone, it was for two reasons. For safety and logistics, right? But you immediately regretted that decision. <laughs> immediately when you received that first bill, didn't you? We're all chuckling because it's true. Why, why, why did you freak out when you got that bill? <coughs> texting, right? I heard a few of you say it, texting. Mo uh, Millennial Mike discovered texting, and that charges were skyrocketing. So here's what we learned from this phase in Millennial Mike's life. <laughs> we oh, there it is. I'm just keeping you guys in suspense here. Millennials, takeaway number four, are early adopters and seek out opportunities to innovate. When it came to social media, Google, instant messaging, texting, mobile devices, they're early. So they pull that now expectation in the workplace and they're looking to innovate. 
They're gonna push the boundaries. They're gonna see how they can work smarter, systemize, or uh, yeah, create systems, automate things. Let's move forward now to the year 2007. Millennial Mike is in college, and he is fortunate enough to have parents that buy him what iconic device? The iPhone. You bet. Now, the iPhone, first of all, I don't think we give, I don't think we give uh, the iPhone enough credit for how much it's just changed everything, right? It's changed the game. But for millennials, this thing was nirvana. They were already texting, right? And the iPhone introduced its first virtual keyboard. It introduced um, the predictive text technology. It could learn new words. And the saving grace of the entire millennial generation, automatic spell check. <laughs> How would we have survived without it? Um, so it's changed the game. And I think really because of all those features I just, I just rattled off, and with the millennials, the largest generation on the planet, I really think they moved the needle. Um, and here in 2007, when the iPhone came out, was fundamental for all of us, all Americans in the room, all, each and every one of you. 2007 was the first year we sent and received more text messages than we did phone calls. Fundamentally changed our behavior. I'm gonna have a little fun here, if I can. Raise your hand if the last communication you had was a phone call. You actually spoke to someone on the other end of a phone. Raise your hand if that was your last piece of communication. I see maybe 10 of you in a room of 500. Our behaviors have changed. I'm not gonna even say this is necessarily a generational thing. We are all experiencing change, and I'm gonna talk about that in a few, but um, all this technology is impacting our, our, the way we communicate, the way we work, the way we live. So here's the takeaway. Millennials communication has and will continue to be shaped by technology. 2008, Millennial Mike is still in college and he bumps into this thing called Twitter. He thinks, man, this looks like a shiny AOL. So he begins, he creates an account, starts using Twitter. And in the early stages, Twitter was really considered a micro blog where people could just share thoughts and ideas. And what that opened, uh, that opened Millennials Mike's eyes to the world of blogging. And so he began blogging and he used Tumblr, which was a, uh, a very millennial friendly blogging platform. And he began sharing his thoughts, ideas, opinions, what have you. And now 50% of all bloggers today are millennials. And here's what we learned from this pivotal point in Millennial Mike's life. Millennials are contributors looking for an active role and an immediate impact. The internet has given them a global platform to have a voice and to, and to contribute, and they've taken advantage of it. And they pull that into the workplace. On day one, they wanna have an impact. On day one, they might send you an email with a list of all the things that are wrong with your organization, <laughs> right? All right, 2009, Millennial Mike is a senior in college and he's about to graduate. Who does that anymore in four years? So he's about to graduate. Before he gets a job, what's he have to do? Shout it out. Resume, network, all, all right answers. LinkedIn, I think before any of those things, before any of that, Millennial Mike has gotta go to Facebook and he's gotta detag himself from all his spring break photos. <laughs> that is priority number one, right? But we laugh at that because it's true, but we laugh at it because but millennials had no idea they were the first on Facebook and they were using it just to hang out with friends and, and to connect and communicate. They had no idea employers were gonna use it to vet them as their character or use that as their personal brand. Um, so very interesting. Uh, I, also wanna, I also wanna say that it's, it's really interesting now how b behaviors are rippling up. I think it's really one of the first times I think in a long time or perhaps ever how quickly behaviors are rippling up the generations. All right, Facebook, I won't do this to this crowd because I like you and I'm your friend. But sometimes if I'm feeling honoring, I'll ask a crowd, raise your hand if, you've ever, if you're on Facebook right now. The whole room pretty much raises their hand. And then I ask them, raise, keep your hand raised if you've ever uh, told yourself or someone else that you would never be on Facebook. And most of that room keeps their hand shamefully raised. So I think we're at a point in how turbulent things are that we need to be careful to be so judgmental or, or, or criticize some of these new forms of communication because we might just be using that same communication in the very new future, especially as these millennials move into the workplace. So my point here, millennials are massively persuaded by their peers and value relationships and experiences over work. 
Millennial Mike, as he's getting ready to find a job, he's amassed large social networks, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and he's gonna lean into those networks to crowdsource his life decisions. He's gonna ask those networks, what book should I read? Where should I go eat? What movie should I see? Uh, what city should I go live in? And oh, really, last on that list is, where should I go work? Millennials still typically choose a city before they actually choose a job. Because again, they value relationships and experiences over work. So if you're trying to connect with this generation, leverage their peers. All right, moving forward. And keeping everyone in suspense. 2012, um, Millennial Mike is now settling in, or he's been, actually he's been in the career, he's been in his career for three years, and he's got three different careers. Right? Seems about right for millennials. Job hopping, seeing what's, what's going on, what's out there. But here's the dynamics that are at play here. How many of you are familiar with Glassdoor, the website Glassdoor? Good, enough of, of you know, a good, good portion of you. Glassdoor, for those that don't know, it's a website that houses employee reviews on their companies, what benefits those companies offer, salaries. It's created tremendous job market transparency. And so now millennials, you can't, know, you can't pull any wool over their eyes. They can actually see what's going on in other organizations. And layer on top of that, Facebook and YouTube, they know exactly what they're missing in other organizations. And so now it's putting new accountability on organizations to make some really dynamic culture changes. So what we learned from this, millennials takeaway number eight is they demand transparency from their leaders, their employers, and their brands. That's kind of been a theme that you've heard throughout the day, that they value authenticity. 2014, Millennial Mike is now settling in as a young professional, and technology continues to shape how he live, lives, works, and play. Specifically, we look at Netflix and Amazon. That's created an on-demand generation. Ma, I have an eight-month-old daughter, and she will not know a world where she can't hit a button and a drone will drop off a package within an hour. So that's gonna reshape how she thinks about shopping, right? So I think there's lots of dynamics at play, especially when we talk about an on-demand uh, generation. Snapchat, how many of you are on Snapchat? Be proud. Yeah, all right, that's, that's, I know where the student table is now. <laughs> Snapchat, if you wanna connect with this generation, you're trying to market this generation, uh, you should be seriously considering Snapchat. A majority of millennials are using Snapchat. Um, it's got the same momentum as a Facebook or Twitter. It's the fastest growing social network today. And you, you'd be, you'd be um, kidding yourself if you think this emerging generation, as they come into the workplace and as they're fundamentally communicating different via Snapchat, that they're gonna be okay communicating just via email. They're gonna fundamentally challenge the, how we communicate in the workplace because they're already communicating in a much different way. Uber and Airbnb has created a love of the share economy for this generation. And then lastly, Slack. How many of you are familiar with the company and the tool Slack? Only a few of you. Slack is, uh, Inc.com just rated Slack as their company of the year. It's one of the fastest growing tech companies in the last decade or two. Um, it is, oop, if we can get those slides back up, my AV team. Um, Slack is one of the fastest growing uh, technology companies out there. And um, what is Slack? It's an app messaging tool. So it's basically a hybrid of Twitter and email, if you will. And so um, why it's so powerful is, this, again, this generation wants to collaborate. They want to use collaborative technologies to communicate, and they're flocking to Slack. And we'll talk a little bit about it later. But here's what else is really incredible about Slack. I think some of you are probably on your devices trying to figure out to download this right now, right? The number one goal for Slack, the organization and the tool, is to eradicate email. Can I get an amen? Right? So again, these technologies are shaping how this generation, how they communicate, how they approach work. And so they're gonna continue to lean into these technologies. All right, and then lastly, in Millennial Mike's journey, 2016, he is now getting ready to step into his first management role. I got a couple of chuckles, okay, yeah, because it's scary, I imagine, right? In fact, 30% of 21 to 32 year olds have already achieved a management position. So the takeaway here, what I wanna ask you is, uh, before I ask you a question, is millennials, high tech and hyper social upbringing have made them disruption prone leaders. How will millennials change your world? How will millennial Mike, in this high tech, hyper social upbringing that he's had, how will that impact your industry? How is that gonna impact 
how you work, especially as they begin making decisions in organizations. And I promise you, please hear me when I say this, I promise you, millennials are not trying to aggravate you on purpose. <laughs> I promise. They have just a fundamentally different background, right? They've grown up, I mean, none of us have ever seen this before. So it has created a new breed of worker, a new breed of consumer. And so we have to start understanding it. And why I think it's so important to look at generations is that there's behavior. So you can pinpoint and understand it, begin predicting how do I adjust my leadership, my communication, my business, my brand. So the question is, will you be ready? When this generation begins stepping in to the workplace into decision-making roles, will you be ready? What's gonna happen? My gut says massive amounts of change. But don't panic. Again, my name is Ryan. I'm here to help, okay? So I'm gonna give you some actionable strategies here in a few. But if, I know we camped out here a lot, but I hope it's really helpful. Again, you guys can have all these slides. But if you don't, if you, don't, if you, don't, if you haven't heard anything else that I say so far, get this one thing. This is really important as well. Nintendo is to blame for everything. <laughs> we now know, we now know. All right, so here's a, just a cheat sheet. Again, this is a, a tool that's also gonna be on that link uh, whenever it's back live. And again, you can just have, that's everything we just talked about. So use this and hopefully it'll, it'll impact um, your organization, your leadership. All right, let's talk a little bit about Generation Z. Let's just kind of touch the surface because they're still pretty young. We don't know a whole lot about them. 73% of Generation Z are connected within an hour or less of waking up. Uh, I think it's maybe when I walk over there that the clicker is. Over 50% of Generation Z say it's easier or more convenient to chat digitally. 77% of Generation Z rely on technology to help accomplish personal and professional goals. And lastly, 65% say people whom they work with would enable their work. So again, this is to just help you get some context around who this generation is. So let's look at what are the difference between millennials and Gen Z. So Generation Z, I believe, is gonna be more pragmatic. They grew up in a very turbulent time, terrorism, war, recession. And they're looking at the millennials. They got a front row seat to the millennials and a lot of their shortcomings, and so they're gonna adjust. The millennials are super optimistic and hopeful, like Robin mentioned, but I think this generation will be much more realistic and pragmatic. Oh, before I go there. More individualistic. Generation Z grew up in a world that was connected. Their parents were posting pictures of their sonogram before they were even born. So a lot of them have a digital footprint before they're even in this world. And so a lot of them are gonna look to peel away and begin developing their own individualism or ind individualistic traits because to them it seems like everyone's done everything and they've already kind of built their social footprint on the, on the web. So we expect them to find more individual uh, ways to, to express themselves. More face-to-face, -face. this might surprise many of you. Uh, but again, millennials had, or Generation Z had a front row seat and to um, what many would say is perhaps the Achilles heel of the millennials, which is lack of interpersonal skills and the ability to communicate face to face. So I think they're gonna counterbalance that, they're gonna focus on that, but also look at the tools they're using. Snapchat, FaceTime, Google Plus Hangouts, Skype. They're actually communicating face to face. Where it might not be in person, it's, it's virtual and it's, they're using motion, sound, and visual to communicate. So I see a resurgence in the face-to-face -face communication. I think we can all be excited about that. More global. As more of the world comes online, it's gonna shrink geographies. The world become flatter, smaller, essentially. And so, of course, this generation's gonna think bound, more boundaryless than the millennials. They're gonna have global uh, thought process and global relatability and global communication skills. They're gonna be less focused. There's more clamoring for their attention than ever before. They have 10 second Snapchats, they have six second Vines. They're consuming this information on a rapid pace. So we anticipate they'll be less focused than millennials. They'll be less parented. Generation X are the folks that are uh, raising this generation, Generation Z for the most part. And Generation X is very aware of the stigma and perhaps the negativity surrounding that everyone gets a trophy parenting style that uh, the millennials had from the baby boomers. So they're gonna, they're gonna actually consider themselves a coach versus a friend when it comes to parenting. And then they're gonna be less educated. You think about uh, Generation Z, actually statistics show that they're not, per, 
looking to pursue higher education as much as the millennials were at the same age? And why would they when there's so many alternatives out there, right? So they're constantly figuring this. We heard it from Chris, too, when you hear about um, the, the student loan debt. So they're evaluating these things in their head. So I would say they, they might be less formally educated because they're going to leverage the web to learn some things and more on the fly in the workplace as well. And then lastly, they may be less noticed. Generation X, Chris was shouting it out. He was trying to give you guys some love. Why? Because you were overshadowed by the, the large baby boom generation. So that very well could happen to Generation Z as well, being overshadowed from the largest generation on the planet, the millennials. All right, this is the last slide before we dig into uh, our next uh, topic and, and, and look at, um, and before I start giving you some strategies. This is really important though. Millennials are a critical mass of change agents. What is critical mass? If you have a scale and you finally have enough of something that tips that scale, that's critical mass, okay? And why are millennials critical mass? Because they're the largest generation on the planet. Where they go, so goes change. Where they go, so goes disruption. Social media is a good example. It was created by a millennial, AKA Mark Zuckerberg for the most part. It was adopted by millennials and now it's gone mainstreamed because of millennials. And I, people always ask me, well, Ryan, why is today different? There's always been generational differences when they come into the workplace. Boomers, when you came into the workplace, massive amounts of change because of your sheer size, right? Here's why today's different though, and here's why we've gotta find our footing. Two reasons why today's different. Technology and, and, and the internet. Technology and the internet have changed the game. It's changed how we live and work, hasn't it? It's changed the game. And so you have those two items and you couple it with the largest generation on the planet, and that's the, that's the recipe for massive, massive disruption. We're living in exponential times. I wanna tell you a little bit about what are these, and what does it look like to live in an exponential uh, time? And I wanna do that with a question. So I'm gonna ask you, and shout it out, shout out whatever comes to your mind. Name an invention that's happened in the past, and we can go back as far as fire if you guys want. So just shout out an invention that's happened in the past. The wheel, electricity, the printing press, airplanes. The light bulb, yeah, what else? Computers, I think we're almost there. We, I think we have two left, two, two other, no. Um, we could basically name anything in this room, light bulbs, you know, stage, monitors, TVs, right? They're, it's incredible how far we've come. But here's what's important, here's why today's different. All those inventions that I heard and that I repeated are all inventions that have impacted our physical world. So that has limited how much growth they have. It's limited how fast other people can adopt it, right? Well, today's inventions are happening in the cloud, a lot of them. They're happening in cyberspace, in the digital world. So that's giving it power to grow exponentially. So let me give you a good example, um, or a couple of examples. If Facebook, you know, it was really an invention that happened in the cloud, right? If Facebook was a country, where would it rank based on population in the world? I think I heard biggest, yes. It would be number one based on population. 1.5 billion people use Facebook. And in August of last year, Facebook, for the first time ever, reached a, a pretty, pretty astonishing uh, statistic. And, and that was one billion people use Facebook in a single day. One billion people use Facebook in a single day. That could not have happened in any other time in history where that many people can use a single tool. And guess what? Facebook started in 2004. It's the biggest country based on population on the planet. Exponential times that we live in. The mobile device that some of you are clearly are playing Candy Crush on right now. Yeah, I see you. <laughs> this mobile device, again, we don't give enough credit. This mobile device is one, all of you that have them in your hand, your purse, your pocket. This device is 100,000 times smaller 